The Kaufman text decoded the oldest religious text in the world. This audio presentation is read and voiced by Shakim Ra. It is provided to the public by Amon Ra University. A theme of relative importance in the Kaufman text which has not received much attention in the past is that of the deceased becoming Heru Neper or becoming when in the scribe of a particular god. Clearly related to the wider group of transformation spells, the notion of becoming the scribe of a god presents an interesting case of transference of a social structure from human life to the religious world. The figure of the scribe made it possible to combine a number of salient mythological and ritual themes, and the extant spells dealing with this notion show a wide range of associated ideas, some remarkably clear and simple and others highly obscure. This presentation begins with narrowing down the concept of a scribe of the gods or nature root by presenting some of the interpretations put forward in the past along with the preliminary analysis of the relationship between scribe and deity in the text. A small group of manuscripts, one of which was not included in the book's edition of the Coffin text, attest to the particular importance within the group of scribe spells of the notion of becoming a scribe of Heheru. The relatively large number of spells attesting to this notion, many of which are clearly related and drawn on a shared body of phraseology, makes it worthwhile to go through the individual themes related to the scribe of Heheru in some detail and presenting the results of this analysis what is a scribe of the gods or nature root? The notion of scribes in the divine world, as evidenced by the pyramid text and carpet text, has been discussed by S. Sharp, who collected and presented the relevant material. Schott points out that the idea of the deceased taking over the role as scribe of Ra is found already in the pyramid text where we also found the earliest examples of threats of destroying the writing implements of hostile or rivaling beings thus at the end of pyramid text 476 the deceased king is poised to take over the position of his predecessor grod grod break your palate snap your pair of reeds tear up your documents of rock Remove him from his position and place in in his position, so that in may shine bright, carrying the fork staff. Such threats proliferate in the Coffin text corpus, especially in connection with the threatening bird beings, Geb Ga and Seket. Shot regarded the presence and roles of scribes in the hereafter, ultimately as a relatively straightforward case of a projection of earthly affairs into the religious sphere. There is no doubt that many of the details of the divine scribes in social and material culture terms are modeled on aspects of daily life, but it is also clear that the detailed conceptions underlying the text go far beyond such a one-to-one -one projection and that scribes have come to play a distant role in the divine pantheon and cosmology. In his monograph on Shabti figurines published a decade after Schultz's article, H. Snyder touches upon the spells with scribal theme, seeing them ultimately in connection with the wish to avoid menial labor after death. Thus, to Snyder, the purpose of becoming a scribe in the pyramid text and coffin text is directly related to the corollary ability to control and personal exemption from such tasks. Across the whole corpus of the Coffin text, 
The notion of a scribe of the gods occurs a number of times, making it possible to make some general observations about the concept. One of the first things that becomes apparent is that the concept is always a relational one. Being a scribe of a god is primarily an expression of a role of a scribe of the god and can be notionally identified with that of the son of the god in question, thus showing a very close association between the two. Thus, at least in one of the Theban manuscripts of the spell, Coffin Text 252 is explicitly understood to bring about the speaker's identity as the scribe of Ra'atu. In mythological allusions in the spell, however, the speaker clearly identifies neither with Ra'atum himself nor with a cultic or administrative role as his scribe, but rather as Ra'atum's son Shu when he searched for Tefnu. I am the great one seeking the great lady. I have come to seek that beard of Ra'atum, which was taken away on that day of rebellion. Thus, the role of the scribe of Ra'atum is actually achieved in the spell by the mythological identification with Ra'atum's son. In some cases, the intimate relation between deity and scribe can become so close as to apparently making the two coincide. Thus, Coffin Text 253 carries the heading, Becoming the Scribe of Lord of All. And the speaker refers to his acting on behalf of my lord in a passage probably referring to the cyclical appearance and withdrawal of the god. In the final line of the spell, however, the speaker says, I will have returned at the first day of the year and appeared as the lord of all, thus showing that the service and assistance to the god provided by the scribe has become so closely entangled with God's manifestation that the speaker has himself become a manifestation of his Lord. In a similar way, Coffin Text 252, titled Becoming the Scribe of Ra'atum, a notion which is affirmed in the spell itself, as I shall become the scribe of Ra'atum. However, the two extant titles of this spell gives the title instead as becoming Ra'atum, which, in the light of Coffin Text 253, may be more than just an error of omission. Spells dealing with the identity as a scribe of the gods shows a wide geographical distribution and are rarely found in longer sequences devoted to this theme. A significant exception to the latter observation is found in three extant collections of spells, mostly dealing with becoming a scribe of Hathor or Hetheru, but also including works associated with scribes of other gods. The spell sequence on M1b is of particular interest for the present purposes is found at the right end of the back or west side of the coffin. The sequence begins with two new spells, labeled Becoming the Scribe of Tehuti and Becoming the Archivist of Ra, respectively, spells A and B, followed by a copy of Coffin Text 539, Becoming the Scribe of Hathor, a badly preserved new spell without rubric, followed by a sequence of known spells, Coffin Text 545, 543, and 533 all connected to Hathor. Becoming the scribe of the Lord of All in 329, becoming the scribe of the Field of Offerings. A recurring concern in the group of spells is that of traveling from one place to another, which can be broadly separated into travels made by the speaker, often stressing his free movement and access to restricted places. On the one hand, and the travels of gods and other beings to meet the scribe on the other side, where it is the power and respect of the latter that is at issue. 
Occasionally, the two themes are combined so that the speaker is met by a group of beings said to come to him, who subsequently grant him access, for example, in the beginning of Coffin Text 540. The sky and the earth come to me. They're great ones. The chief gods come to me. They open for me the unapproachable roads. In general, the setting of this granting of access seems to be a celestial locale, which can be described in various terms. Mostly a set of doors or gates being opened is referred to, designated, either as the doors of Penedet or Pendenden, this gate which Hathor made. Doors in the horizon, or a variety of references to doors of Ra, involving the numbers 3 and 4. The doors are said to be opened either by a group of subservient beings, as in the passage from the beginning of Coffin Text 540 just cited, or once by the speaker himself, though in most cases it is not specified exactly who opens them. The beneficiary is either the speaker or in a single case, my mistress Hathor. In many cases, the purpose of opening the doors, thereby granting access for the speaker, is not specified or shown by the context. In Kaufman Text 533, the statement about open doors is clearly situated in the context of carrying out cultic services for Hathor and Ra'atun. And after his claim of opening the doors, the speaker says, I traverse the great house of Hathor, so that, at least in this case, the doors referred to seem to be those of a temple or shrine of Hathor. Occasional references to the horizon in this connection may be well understood in the same way as indicated, for instance, by the statement, I perform the recitation for their offerings inside the horizon of Hathor. In the beginning of Coffin Text 540, the theme of the open doors is followed by the speakers claiming the thrones in two boats, which are said to come to him. Before this passage is found one in which the speaker addresses Geb, telling him to look as the speaker grows inside the egg and breaks out of it. And the reference to the boats leads directly onto the theme of the speaker's promotion before all other scribes of Hathors and the associated mastery over the writing implements as discussed above. Always beside thought, the deceit with his word, the legacy of the whole eye of Horus, what he has copied, already in polymer race, reaches his goal of two plots of land in the field of offerings. Which is the DNA heritage, or both, Lambda operator sites that allow control of PR for crow production. The deceit is the writer of words, or the scribe of the lands beside thought, Coffin Text 1048, in the field of the eye, 1049. As the deceit comes into existence, so do his words and his legacy. He has come from primeval time to Harold Rock at the gates of the sky, Coffin Text 1049. The Book of Two Ways, verse 1,169. The deceased has cleansed the injured eye and brought the sound eye with the mansion of the moon as witness. The Book of Two Ways, verse 1,094. While Isis shows him the ways in crossing the sky. Or the lactose path of the maltose transport system. The mansion of the moon, or the full moon, suggests full phage production and birth size because of the lactose nutrient medium of Isis.
It seems as if the pharaohs understood their afterlife as a secret, groaning experiment where the kings and nobility did their best to prevent the plebs or common folk from having the knowledge. Keeping knowledge secret from the masses was a method of screaming. Keeping knowledge secret from the masses was a method of screening human DNA. With this knowledge, the kings and nobility possessed directions and guidelines, such as going to the polar cusp of the earth to meet Ra for transformation that screened out most of the population. On the cellular level, this translates to directions indicating the polar cap or gap between the cytoplasm and cell wall where dynamic polar localization of proteins critical for cell division and cell cycle control exists in bacteria. By being in this enriched protein localization area or origin for replication, the genetic heritage or DNA of the deceased, that is, of the kings and nobility, may have transformed into a different product. Then, if the deceased had been at any other location in the earth cell. We must remember that the pharaohs viewed the deceased as Osir, for their earliest evidence equates the deceased pharaoh with Osiris. The deceased goes to the sacred portal from which Atum proceeded, where Hu and Sia are present with Atum. So we are back at the beginning of the creation, the origin of time, a period following our tomb's creation of the foundation of forms and elements or the first DNA of Phage Lambert.